Hello everyone, today's video is on run length encoding. Well actually it's more run length decoding because in a future upcoming release of the CBM Program Studio they are supporting run, run length encoding of the screens. From within the screen editor you can actually go in and encode your screens and what what that does, it's a real simple level of compression so if you have like, in this case, 12 W's in a row, it encodes by saying, putting the number 12 and then the letter W, and then you just keep repeating that. And you can get some pretty good compression depending upon the type of screen that you have. If you have a lot of uh, elements in there with a, a lot of uh, different characters, you might not get that good of compression. But I was in communication with the old school coder who I am now a Patreon, of follower of. One of the perks of being a Patreon of the Old School Coder is that y you can get access to the beta releases that are currently out for the CBM program studio. And there's two beta releases out there, uh, Beta 3 and Beta 4. And there's a lot of new stuff coming. He was, uh, old, uh, he was letting me know, including things like Git integration, this RLE encoding, they're even planning on possibly in the future supporting Kick Assembler uh, down the line. So there's a whole bunch of things coming and I'm really excited to, to hear that because the, the project has kind of been on hiatus but Arthur Jordison is still working on the project and uh, Old School Coder is helping him out. Another benefit of being a Patreon of Old School Coder is that he's welcomes questions and and allows me to bounce ideas off of him when I get stuck on, on programming. And today's program, that I'm, I'll be getting to it in a moment, wouldn't have been possible without him. He, he helped me out quite a bit. One of the other benefits of being a patron of the Old School Coder is that you get to join his Discord. So you can go on there and have conversations uh, with his other, with the other patrons and and that can be helpful, get um, your questions and, um, and ideas bounced off other people as well. I also wanted to shine the spotlight on the other patron that I've recently uh, become a member of, and that is Shalon's YouTube channel. And he, he also has a Twitch, uh, Shalon50k. And what he, one of the things that he's doing, which is really, really amazing, is he's creating a game um, on Twitch and he's showing you step by step how to make a game and all the techniques that he uses and he, he's using a, a tool called kick assembler which is an, an amazing assembler program package and uh, his videos here starting with episode one are rather lengthy like between three to six hours each and so I've been watching these and I'm like on episode four now so the other thing that uh, he, he really does a lot, he, he reads the comments that are scrolling by on the right and he answers people's questions and he gives examples and he's, it's really like taking a class and learning how to make a game. So very fascinating and it's, I highly recommend you check it out. You'll learn a lot if you're interested in Commodore 64 programming. And then along that same vein, I've discovered a blog called the Retro 64, 64 Blog. And this, this is an amazing blog. I don't think I've ever seen one quite like this. He, he has a, a programming section on there. And he has write-ups on all these different topics. They range from like the TIA, TOD clock, uh, SID music and then all the way to uh, smooth scrolling and some of the programs are in basic. He does graphics mode and he does circles and, and 3D rotations and uh, it's really amazing. He has write-ups on each one and in each one there's a program. And some of the programs I looked on here I didn't even know it was possible to do some of the programs he's done, some of the amazing things that he's done in basic and and he gives really uh, excellent explanations. And so, 
Anyway, I thought it was uh, something that was real interesting to, to point out and go check it out. And I think you, you won't uh, regret it. So now let's go, let's go ahead and take a look. So there's a new setting in the beta when you're in the screen editor. You can go in and you can say export assembler and you have a few options. So, I mean, obviously you're going to want to have a screen. <laughs> you want to have a screen first. So let me bring one up. So if you've ever designed a screen in here and using the screen editor, you can go up here and select export assembler. And now you have, have the capability of going in and checking the checkbox for run to use run length encoding. And then there's a few options here to separate the char color data and length or interleave the char color data and length. So all you have to do is put in your your screen number the, that you want to export, then go ahead and select if you want to include the background color and then hit OK. And then you can copy that to your clipboard. And then what, to, what the topic of today's video is to go ahead and look at a program that I developed um, to decode that and, and display it back on your screen. So I've already written up a program and I took the time today to, to, to write a pretty basic assembly language program that would decode a screen. And what I have here is data that was exported from the screen editor. And then I, and I have some labels attached to them. So here's the character data and the numbers. So if you have a space right here and then a character drawn, that many that many times so if it's 20 is a space so it's going to have um, decimal 87 spaces at the very beginning and then you go to the next character that's all this program does is you loop through this table at the bottom of the program and depending upon if you're using non-interleaved like this so you have this is your character data and then this is your color data and it's the same thing with the color except you'll store your color in location D800, starting at the top left portion of the color data screen normally. And you'll have the color value, and then below that, the number of times that color value appears. So the first seven positions would be um, 01, which I'm, I think is red, I'm not sure. So going up to the top of the program, I have a few labels. 400 for the VIC screen at 400, um, top left portion of the screen, D800 for the color. Oops. And then I, I wanted to a, set a label to be the high byte of the screen plus three. So 04 plus three would be 07. And for the color information, it would be D8 plus three, which is 9AB, so it's DB. And so these values help me determine when the program can exit. So down here, what I've done is I've started a program called Draw Screen. And I've already developed this further, but I wanted to show the, the early stage. So right at the beginning, what it does is it comes down, tries to grab the, the first number value. And then it stores that right here. So when it's drawn it, it knows how many times to, to print that character on the screen. And before we even get to that point, it checks to see if we're at the bottom right portion of the screen. So it is checking to see, are we at zero? As you draw your characters, you'll start here at 400. As you're going off to the, you know, when you fill out, you'll, you'll end up going to, to the 500 area and then 600, and then down here at the bottom, it's 700. And the bottom right is 7E7. So that's what this is checking. Have you hit seven on, on the high byte? If not, just continue with the program. If you have hit seven, then check. Have you hit E8? If it's greater than or equal to E8, the program's finished. The next thing it does is it brings in the first character in this case, a space. And then it comes in and it 
in a loop, it draws that space the number of times that you already saved off up here. So it just draws that character 20 times, or 57, hex 57 times, which is 87 times. And then once it's drawn that, you just have to set up the next character. So after it's finished looping through the initial set of values, what I decided to do was, if we went 87 over, I decided to add 87 to the Vic screen position right here. That way it'll be ready for the next character. So what it's doing is loading, loading the low byte of this variable, adding it, adding whatever character is in here, however many times you looped previously, adding that to the low byte. If that tripped the high byte, then you increment it by one. Then we set up to grab the next character by incrementing the low byte and the high byte of the next number. So we're gonna grab Instead of 57, we're going to grab 05. So we're going to set that address so it's ready to pick up the character and the number in that position. And by the same token, it does the same thing for the character. So it's, it, it sets the address high, high byte and low byte of that. So this is incrementing the high and low byte of the position of the number value. And then this one is incrementing the high byte and the low byte of the character value. And it's storing those right here and right here. And it's just incrementing them one at a time. And then it jumps back up to the top of the screen and it just keeps looping like that until it's done. So you can see I, I have not at this point implemented the color portion, but uh, I have had it go ahead and draw one of the screens I've done in the past. So you can see in order to do the color values right now, right now we're using these two labels. In order to do the color values, we have to use these two labels. And so I thought it'd be easier to just make these areas self-modified code. And we just do a little bit of setup at the top. So here in this version, you can see I did some setups. So now you have to do all this setup just to, to draw the screen just exactly the same way we just did in the previous program. All right, so this is essentially the same code as the previous program, but now we have added in some self-modifying code to, to allow the color portion to be drawn using the same program, the draw screen program. It's just self-modifying these areas that I have the FF on. And it, it does make the program look bigger. It does add bulk to it. But some of this can be reduced, in which I do later with a few macros to make it look more readable. So let's take a look at it. So that's what it looks like in color. So the next step was to take this program and support the interleaved version. And we'll take a look at that right now. So here's what the interleaved uh, ver, uh, data looks like when you export it. So instead of organizing your data like in this way, where you have a space on this line, on this line, and then the character, the number of times you will display it, and then the next character and the number of times you display it, interleaved has it all on the same line. You have your character, then the length, so how many times you'll display it, the next character, then the length, the next character, then the length, and then on the next line, it's the color, color value, then the, the number of color values, the next color value, the number of color values, and so on. To achieve that, in, instead of just going one at a time, we have to add two to get to the next one. So if we're starting off with the first characters at 20, we have to add two to get to the next character. Add two to get to the next one. So this value, these two values here and here have to be two self-modified up here. So all this is doing is setting up to draw the interleave version and then to call this subroutine with these values set, set in. 
and then the color values are set up and then the draw screen routine is called for the final time. And then I, I put an if statement to determine which one you're running. Then on the next version, RLE3, I, I created a couple of macros to try to reduce the code. I didn't end up using this one, so I can take it out. And basically it's an LDA, STA, LDA, STA. Wherever I had this pattern, LDA, STA, LDA, STA, I just substituted it with this macro. And in the next version, I cleaned it up, got rid of all the, the stuff that was commented out. And then in my final version, which is RLE5, I put in a compiler directive. So it eliminated, uh, I had to have some labels that were only in the interleaved version, but I didn't want them in the comments down below. So I did this compiler directive. So if you're, if you want the non interleaved version, you comment out this line. And if you want interleaved, you, you bring it in. Of course, you have to switch between what you have to comment in the data you want to use non interleaved or interleaved version. I also added back in some comments that were stripped out in the RLE4 version. So one of the things the old school coder helped me out with was this compiler directive called operator calc. And I, I hadn't heard of it. And what this does is it sets the operator precedence. If it's set to calc, the assembler will carry out any calculations and then get the high or low byte. If it's set to high low, the assembler will get the high or low byte and then do the calculation. I ran into that problem when I was trying to do this plus one right here. It wasn't working right until I did this. And so I thank uh, Old School Coder for that. Really helped me. So that's pretty much this program and I'll put it up on my GitHub here shortly. Thanks for watching.